Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, Oracle steps up and releases an early patch for Java, but it doesn't fix everything. We'll tell you what's still exposed. Plus, getting access to people's bank accounts through phone tones, and then it's a big batch of your emails and our answers. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 96 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on February 7th, 2013. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible ScaleEngine.com, which is amazing. You should go check it out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the teacher, and the tech, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Episode 96, man. Welcome. Yes. And uh, we're going to have, uh, speaking of uh, episode 96 and the uh, March towards episode 100, we're going to have a little more information about our special 100 uh, celebration in the feedback section of the show. So yep. stay tuned. And later on in the show, I have a new book pick. A book just came out this week from an author that you and I both love. So yes, I'm going to talk about a that later. It's sequel to a book I've already read. So yep, yep. I'm going to have to pick that up as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a pretty good price, too. So we got a great show, tons of news to cover, great feedback questions, a great roundup. So why don't we start with actually a little bit of good news out of Oracle, huh? Yes. Uh, so Oracle has responded to all the Java problems or whatever. <laughs> and oh. they released the February critical patch update almost three weeks early. Uh, so they released it on February 1st instead of the scheduled date of February 19th. Okay. Uh, so the patch fixes 50 different issues uh, with Java, uh, most of them being client-side. Uh, mm, mm. More than half of the fixes have a CVSS risk score. So that's a common vulnerability scale, and it ranks how risky each vulnerability is on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh-huh. Uh huh. 26 of the 50 vulnerabilities were rated 10 out of 10. <laughs> and then there were a couple that were in the nines and then some sevens and then on and on. That's like a new achievement unlocked right there. That's great. Kind of, yes. <laughs> uh, so yes, they fixed uh, more than half of the 50 vulnerabilities had a score of 10 out of 10 and are now fixed. Mm. Uh, yeah. Also, this critical patch update covers issues number 29, 50, 52, and 53 reported by Security Explorations. That's a Polish firm that we've been following for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, they posted these 53 different vulnerabilities they found in Java. Right. Uh, however, there is no fix for number 51 yet. Uh, but if you go to the Security Explorations site, you can see that they've been working back and forth with Oracle, and Oracle's working on a fix for 51. They just haven't finished it yet. Oh, okay. Uh, but this, the latest update does cover uh, 50, 52, and 53. So at least they're doing something. So what we're actually seeing here is instead of Oracle sitting until they have... So what they used to do is they would sit till all the patches that they knew about were ready and then they'd ship them all at once to mitigate right. the amount of updates. They schedule when these patches are going to come out a year ahead of time. Like they already know when the, ne- the next patch for... Or like when the patches for Java are going to come out, right? It's like uh, June 18th. And then there's one in September. And, and so then if it, the next if it doesn't fit in that window, they just yeah. don't ship. Yeah. Basically, they ship critical patch updates four times a year on specific dates. <laughs> uh, now, they've done a couple out of band, like emergency patches. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but mostly the patches wait for those critical patch updates. Um, and in this case, they bumped that critical patch update forward a few weeks because they wanted to get the fixes out so that people could still use Java. Yeah, well, because people are turning it off, and companies like Apple are just disabling yep. it across all of their customers' desktops. Yeah, and even Firefox, is, uh, if it's not the latest version, they disable it but uh, in the background. Yeah. Uh, in addition to uh, last update, they added an option in the Java control panel to disable Java in all browsers, meaning that you can only use Java applications that are on your computer or... Uh, via Java, Java Web Start, not as applets in the browser mm-hmm. to prevent being exploited like that. Uh, so that was in the last update, I think uh, 10 or 11. Uh, in addition to that, they've also made a change in this latest update that changes the default security setting to high, which requires that users manually approve the running of all unsigned applets uh, rather than those applets being able to run without 
So like the, being able to run silently. Wow. Yeah, that seems obvious. Yeah. Uh, well, the medium setting is like only certain risky ones would pop up because. However, risky I don't know how I don't know how useful it's going to be because people have been trained just for yes. so long to just click yes when stuff pops up anyway. Thanks, UAC. That I don't know. It's not. Well, it wasn't just UAC. It was things before that. But yes. Yeah, it comes down to, you know, people just click it without reading it anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I have a quote here from Oracle saying, The size of this critical patch update, as well as its early publication, demonstrates Oracle's intention to accelerate the release of Java fixes, particularly to help address the security worthiness. I think they meant worthiness, but uh, <laughs> of the Java runtime <laughs> environment in desktop browsers. Uh, however, the next scheduled update for Java is June 18th, 2013. And they have the schedule going all the way out into 2014. They don't actually seem to have accelerated the schedule at all. So this is, this is software development driven by bureaucracy instead of the technological needs of the software product. Well, oh, basically it seems Oracle uh, wants you to think that they're going to solve these issues more quickly from now on. But... As far as their schedule goes, their schedule is still set to only do it four yeah, times a year. Yeah, yeah, yep. <clears throat> hmm. Maybe uh, we'll see that bumped up to a schedule where they do it, you know, every two months instead of every three. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I mean, didn't uh, didn't Adobe go to a monthly? Uh, Maybe we'll see they, them do they something had, like that. And then now they've gone to silently updating it as right. often as they can. Right, right, right. That's uh, right. Which you know might be better. Does, yeah, and uh, you know they. I know in the past you'd have specific applications require specific versions of the Java runtime. So that's exactly. probably why they and never. That's why Java has gone to the slower update cycle. Yeah, uh, and it cause it's it's all kinds of messy. Right. Well, I mean, good on them for getting at least what they have. You know, mm-hmm. at least the code they have written. At least they're getting that published. Yeah. Because you know, otherwise we'd still be waiting and all be vulnerable to these update uh, to these uh, known. Mm-hmm. Exploits. And it's, it maybe will help curb some of the anti-Java momentum that's out there. Maybe. Yep. I don't know. Any other thoughts on that one? Nope. All right. Well, this next story is pretty interesting because it reminds it me of, uh, like, what would be, like, the dystopian future if Bitcoin took over, what would probably start happening all over the place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, am I a right? A little bit. Okay. Tell uh, me what's a going on. Bit. So, uh, some researchers in New Zealand have developed an attack against microfinancing banks in Africa. Uh, So, a lot of these banks in Africa use audio one-time passwords. Oh. Uh, Since users don't have smartphones, they just have regular old dumb phones. Uh, And SMS is not widely deployed and usually fairly expensive. Yeah. So, the way the systems work is uh, the user goes to the bank's website on their computer and logs into the bank and makes a transaction or whatever. And then the bank wants to confirm that transaction. So, the bank calls their mobile phone... The user answers and then holds their phone up to the speakers on their computer, and then their browser through Flash will play some audio, uh, a bunch of tones, Uh, and then that verifies that the person who's making the transaction has the phone. Okay. All right. So it plays tones. All right. Okay. Hmm. And then the bank hears the tones through the cell phone. Yeah. And then compares them and makes sure they're right. Okay. Uh, so wouldn't you just have to figure out, like... Well, the, the tones, tones are supposed to be random, right? Okay, okay. All right, all right. Right, it's supposed to be like, um, you know, those one-time keypads we have, except for without having to have a token, right? And since it's not a smartphone, it can't run an app that generates one of those, you know, like eight-digit temporary password numbers, Right, you you've seen those authenticators for like PayPal and oh yeah, like the Google one and so oh, on. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Ah, so instead of having to have a smartphone that can run that app, they through Flash your computer plays a sound and you hold your phone up to the speakers and uh, it your phone hears the sound and your bank is on the other end of the phone line and says oh that's the right sound. That's an interesting system. Yeah. Uh, so the researchers wrote a Python script uh, <laughs> that simulated logging into the bank ten thousand times. <laughs> And they recorded the audio that was played to the computer all 10,000 times. 
<laughs> uh, basically, they, they hooked up a Skype in number and told the bank that was their cell phone number. Right. Of course. And so Skype was configured to auto answer and then play the output from the browser into the bank or whatever. But they used a, a man in the middle proxy to capture the flash file for every one of these ah, attempts. Ah. And then they extracted the MP3 out of the flash file so they would have the audio from all 10,000 of these one-time passwords. They saved those audio files as the timestamp, and then they went through and looked for any that were the same. So they, okay, if, if we did it twice within this many seconds, the one-time password was still the same. So each one-time password is good for, or is used for about this many seconds or whatever. Right, right. Um, which in itself might be an issue, I don't know. Uh, but they found a number of issues with the system. The first one is that when users go to log into their bank, they, their login is their mobile phone number, and then they have a four-digit PIN number. Rather than having a username or like a bank card number. So right away, it means that if you know someone's phone number, it's only a matter of guessing the four-digit PIN and you can uh. get into their account. Uh, but on top of that, it just if it was separate, then if someone was, say, brute-forcing bank card numbers, they wouldn't know the user's phone number yet. That would be another piece of information they would need in order to execute an attack. But in this case, because the phone number is your login, it's not a separate piece of information. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why it can be argued that it's more secure if a website has a username and a password instead of your email address and your password. Because then, you know, people that know your email address don't necessarily know your username. Right. Or if someone download, you know, gets the username and password from a key sniff or something, they don't know your email address and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, and email is just a lot more vulnerable. I mean, people yeah. have, like, Outlook installed in their machines where you just open it up and it downloads their email. So somebody walking by could just sit down and retrieve something if it gets sent there. You know, it's, yeah. if you're and in a workspace like and things like that, it's not that safe. Yeah. Uh, they also found that the audio one-time passwords are not cryptographically random. <laughs> Basically, they're... They're not long enough, and they're not random enough. Uh, and the audio one-time password is only a thousand milliseconds long, or one second. Uh, you know, they could easily be two or three seconds instead, and probably be much more secure that way. Right. Bigger number, more random. Yeah. Uh, based on their analysis, they found that audio one-time passwords are, only contain about fifty-five bits of information. So that's not very secure at all. Uh, you know. That's like a really short password, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because as, as we go here, the chat room's like, gosh, you know what this kind of sounds like? Is it sounds like a movie hacking scheme. Like, we'll hack the bank well, computers what, by playing the I tones first, back. Well, when I first uh, heard audio one-time passwords, I thought they were, you know, it was like the old movies where, you know, it was like, my voice is my password, verify me or whatever. That's what I thought when you said it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but there are these tones. It just seems that the tones aren't long enough. Also, the... Even though the patent says the tones are supposed to be uh, DTMF, they're just plain uh, multi-frequency. So they're not, they're like uh, the telephone tones from the 70s rather than uh, from the, the, the current system that we use. So they're using a system that uses flash, that doesn't use very sophisticated tones, that are delivered via MP3s that can be stripped out, and they're not even, they're not even very... They're not even using modern telco technology to do it. <laughs> well, I don't know what the standard in Africa is. Oh, okay, that's true. <laughs> but it, it seems to actually not match the patent that they filed about this system, which is wow. fun. Um, but yes, uh, so, so, now, so the it, researchers haven't released all the information because they don't want other people to be hacking these banks. But they just used Skype, Firefox, yeah. a Firefox plugin called iMacro, and then yeah. the iMacro had like and a lot of the, the middle proxy written in Python. <laughs> I mean, really does not no, this, take a this ton was, of... No, that, that, that was to do it with their own account. They, they had an account at the bank, and they yeah. were just capturing these one-time passwords to see if they're random enough. Right, but I mean, that's the, that's the dangerous part, is if you, if you make it easy enough for somebody to monitor like that, they're going to start figuring it out. Right, well, if the one-time passwords were random enough, it, it should be, be fine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but if they find a correlation between the timestamp and the one-time passwords, then they can predict what the one-time password might be at a specific timestamp. Assuming, uh, we don't know all the information because they didn't publish it all because they didn't want people to know it. They're just saying, you know, there's these obvious problems here. And they're looking at the patent too. But if it's based on, a, if, if 
you were able to predict what the one-time password is going to be at a specific time. The research uh, said that you could save the one-time password, the audio one-time password, as the voicemail greeting on someone's phone number, right <laughs> on their voicemail. Wow! And then if you call them to make the line busy when the bank calls, the bank will get the voicemail. Or if you set up, if you since you've probably hacked their voicemail in order to change the, the greeting, yeah. you could also enable call forwarding or you true, know, automatic true. voicemail or yeah, something that like that point, yeah. so that the voicemail picks up automatically right away. Uh, so this way, when the bank calls, they get these tones and, you know, basically the system assumes that when the bank calls you, it's actually connecting to your cell phone. Right. But if you have call forwarding or... You can be sent it to a Skype account that has that as the voicemail or Google yep, Voice. Or, or it could just... Yeah, it could be, so it could be going to voicemail, to a different phone, to an online service or anything like that. Uh, so the system assumes that when it calls, it's going to get an actual person answering the phone, which isn't necessarily true. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, brute force hacking voicemail passwords is not that hard. Uh you know, there was a big scandal in the UK not long ago where a newspaper was doing this, like a tabloid mm-hmm. was doing this to access people's voicemail. Yeah, Pierce Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, voicemail passwords are usually only three or four digits. Uh, mine's six, but that's still not all that difficult. Um, and, you know, if you already know the person's phone number, because, you know, say you're, you, because it's their username for the banking site. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, some voicemail systems are still susceptible to a system where if you spoof the caller ID to be... It just automatically number, goes in. Yeah. It lets you in without a password at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, some carriers, especially in Africa, offer a web interface to access your voicemail. So you log in over the web and you can download your voicemail as like .mp3s or whatever. Yeah, or a WAV file or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like actually our phone system has a system like that. It, yeah. There's no web interface, but it emails me the dot .wav mm-hmm. yeah. automatically. Right. Um, so based on that, it would allow them to brute force against it on the web, which is probably a lot easier and harder to trace than brute forcing against an actual voicemail system where you have right. to keep calling. Right. So to recap, we don't want the banking system to have anything to do with the phone system or any kind of authentication uh, or email. <laughs> so probably. just the two most common me- methods of electronic communication that people have. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing because I wonder if we're going to see these micro payment systems take off more. Well, one one of the slides in there was talking about how a bunch of different payment industry people are like, you know, some of these solutions they're coming up with in in Africa are probably what's going to become the future here just because they're not restricted by systems that were already in place. Yeah. They can basically do whatever they want. Well, they can prototype them in a sense. Yeah. They can prototype them, but also. They can try things that are like well outside the box because or regulations or whatever. Yes, yeah, because yeah. you know they have an open hand there. But yeah, it, yeah, it seems like uh, you know it was just the first person to offer a system got adopted over there, and it wasn't necessarily a very secure system. Right, and I'm sure the people making the decisions didn't know how to properly review it as well as they should have, even though it's for financial yeah. transactions. And you know, it, and they probably maybe developed the system when they didn't foresee things like. Firefox with extensions that could record sessions and Skype that would be taking calls to the computer and you know maybe they didn't foresee that stuff and they developed it. Well, in, no, that stuff's all been along around yeah, longer. You're than right. This I was awesome. going to say they but developed some. it in the late '90s, but even they should have figured it out then. <laughs> There's no but excuse. Yeah, in, in this case, uh, they would basically brute force to guess phone numbers and PIN numbers until they get into somebody's web interface. Yeah, and then maybe cross-reference that with a list of phone numbers that they've hacked the voicemail for, and then do this. Yeah. Hmm. Or, and, you know, if they can predict the uh what the one time password is and they can do all kinds well, of Well and stuff. the other thing that the, the, the other thing that kind of strikes me about it is just reviewing the technology. We're talking Skype, Firefox, and Python is really yeah. what they needed to pull this off. Well, anybody yeah. watching this show but has again, access that, to that. They didn't they needed more than that to in order to hack the bank. This is just what they did to record the information about their own account. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I know. I understand. But I, yeah. that, that level of information they're able to collect with just tools that yeah. you could download within a span of five minutes off but the internet. But the system should be secure enough that it doesn't matter if you can collect that information. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. <clears throat> That's for sure. It shouldn't matter. You're right. Right. Well, any other thoughts on that one? 
Uh, no, that's about it for that one. All right, Alan, well, let's take a pause here and thank our sponsor of this week's show, the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com. And this is very, very awesome. And I, 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 I uh, on the pre-show, on the live stream, people saw me when I got the, the email came into my inbox right before the show started. And I was like, how can they do this? They are extending the 47% off offer that they launched for the Super Bowl. Now, it will expire on the 13th of February, so the 13th of this month. Uh, but if you want to save 47% off anything you order at GoDaddy, domains, renewals, whatever, use the code GO47OFF1 when you check out. I mean, we still have Tech295 to get a .com for $2.95. Tech295 is still working, but GO47OFF1, I mean, hello, that is 47% off of anything you order. Yeah, go I'm take gonna, advantage of that. think of something to buy just... Yes. Yes. And you know what? If you folks want to think of something, maybe you want to get like some awesome domains that re- redirect to the TechNap show page over on Jupiter Broadcasting or redirect to our subreddit. If there's an awesome domain you want to give us for our episode 100 as a as a, like a celebration gift, go use that code. Go 47 off 1. I mean, go daddy, you're crazy. You are crazy, GoDaddy. I love that, Danica, hooking us up with the best deals. Of course, Tech295 still gets you the dot-com for $2.95. But go, seriously, go get something 47% off. (laughs) That's that's crazy. It's crazy. And uh, thank you to GoDaddy for supporting the TechSnap program. You can find links to that in the show notes. Yeah, I'm going to have to go buy some stuff just because it's 47%. Shopping spree. All right, Alan. Well, uh, should we talk about uh, the bad news that came out of Twitter? Sure. Sort of... uh, Uh because I like, actually got, I was actually affected by this. So. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Sort mm-hmm. of one of these things that I actually managed to just move right unscathed. No problem at all. But you got well, hit. Uh, yeah. I think specifically it affected people that had very, very old accounts. Mm, okay. All right. So Twitter uh, reported via their security blog uh, that some of their servers were compromised. Uh, so the Twitter security team detected an unusual pattern of attempts to access their infrastructure. And in the process of investigating that, they found an ongoing live attack. And they believe that attackers may have had access to the username, email address, session token, and the salted uh, passwords for approximately 250,000 users. Yeah, they're salted at least. That's good. Yes. Uh, so it seems that maybe what happened here was that the attackers managed to get the first 250,000 users out of the database. Okay. Or something to that effect. Because... Uh, in particular, it seemed to affect people who had really old Twitter accounts. Uh, so if Twitter believes that you were affected, you will have already gotten a password reset email probably last week. Uh, my old account did. My current account did not. Uh, that's why I found... That's one of the reasons why I was postulating that it was only affecting older Twitter accounts. Because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, my first Twitter account is older than like 97% of all Twitter accounts or something. Wow, you were on there early. Were you, was it still yes. a texting service when you got on there? Or had it gone uh, to the web just about then? It was still on the web, but okay. just, I think. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> chat room brings up a possibility that it might have been a, a compromise of a backup file or something, or mm-hmm. an old copy of a database. That's possible. I, I was just assuming that they're doing an SQL dump or something and they only got the first you know, 250,000 rows of the database or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, so if Twitter believes that your, your password, your hashed password may have been compromised, it will have reset your uh, password and sent you an email. Uh, Twitter reminds you to choose a password that is at least 10 characters long, a mix of upper and lower case and numbers and symbols and so on, and to never use the same password for more than one site. Oh, yes, we also remind <laughs> you. <laughs> yes. Uh, the blog also mentions, uh, you know, the attacks against the New York Times and the Washington Post. Yeah. Uh, but then they go on to also mention, you know, the Java exploits and how Apple is disabling Java by default and so on. Why are you bringing that? Why are they bringing all that up, do you suppose? Exactly. I was like, and, you know, how browsers are disabling the plugin. And that was creating this false equivalency or some relationship between the problems with Java and the Twitter servers. And yeah, there is that- no correlation at all. I mean, that has to be intentional, and I wonder, is it, it's either A, to defer blame, or, you know, to sort of to sort of deflect some of the heat, saying, you know, a lot of people, big institutions are having this problem right now, look at the New York Times, right. or is it fear-mongering? Well, when, it was, when they mentioned the New York Times and the Washington Post, and you're saying, you know, this was a sophisticated attack, and, and it might have been related, that makes sense. But then bringing up the Java exploit that targets end users, not servers, doesn't make any sense. 
Mm -hmm. And you know, and then further down in the post, they remind users to disable Java and include links to find out how to do it. And Are I they just, trying to imply that Java is somehow related to this? I don't think so. I, I maybe they're just um, trying to go with. It know. almost kind of sounds like fud a little bit. If like they're, they're gonna get if they're gonna get people to read their article that you know, yes, people should disable Java, but I don't see why it was included in the article about Twitter We itself. also yeah. echo the advisory from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and their security experts and encourage users to s disable Java in their browser. In fact, they crossed out on their computers, which is what they had originally. For yeah. instructions on how to disable Java, read this recent Slate article. They it sound like they are blaming Java. Kind of. Or, yeah, trying to deflect a little bit. Huh. It's weird. Yeah, that is weird. Yeah. Good catch, Alan. Well, and you know what else I thought was kind of funny is they titled the blog... Keeping our users secure. Yes, Which, even though it's actually not. So we got hacked. How corporate well, is Twitter going to get? They reset their passwords at least. So. That's true. They are keeping those users secure. Good point. Uh, yeah, thankfully, uh, because I think I was uh, an old codger who was. I, I, I don't. I, I don't warm up to social networks very fast. I'm actually surprised you jumped in so early because. Well, you know, I never used it. I just <laughs> reserved my username. Good thinking, Alan. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I've reserved that username on uh, lots of social networks that I never intend to use at all. Yeah, it's that's just a good so idea. that someone else can't use my name. Then you make it a land grab before somebody else does. Uh, well, all right. it's mostly uh, as part of controlling the Google results for my name as much as I can. That's a great tip, and you know, it's funny because uh, I've I've had clients who said, you know, we have a problem. We have people that have said bad things about us online. And because they don't have a site, they don't have a Facebook page, they don't have anything like that, they're not putting anything out there for Google to lock on for their company name. So when you search their company name, you're getting these bad Yelp reviews and stuff. And, you know, it's a problem. So what you're doing is you're sort of, in some way, trying to have a little bit of say in the conversation in the search results. Right. Uh, should we move on to the next story or any other thoughts on that one? Uh, no, that's about it for that one. All right. So uh, the death of a network card just from some packets, is that what this is? Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, these sysadmins that work for a company that makes uh, on-premise voice uh, VoIP servers. Uh huh. It's like a device that goes on your premise and runs your VoIP network. Sure. Uh, we're trying to s debug a problem uh, that would basically cause their on-premise VoIP devices, which are basically little asterisk servers, uh, to suddenly fail. And basically, it turns out what they discovered was actually a bug in the Intel EEPROM on the network cards. Oh, okay. Uh, so, in this blog article, it's a very interesting story of the steps they had to go through to reliably reproduce the problem in an order to attempt to isolate it. Right. So, the first step to figuring out why their boxes are dying is being able to make the box die on command. Okay. So, you got to kill right? a few cards. You got to crack a few eggs, Alan. Well, now the cards are not completely dead. They just they okay. Well, lose. They basically they drop the carrier and they won't work again until you power cycle. Oh, okay. So it's not like, like you, you, you don't do have a, to. If you do a reboot, that's not good enough. You have to actually physically power the machine off and back on. Yeah, I have, uh, now this is not because of they fail. I have capture cards here in my studio that uh, if they get the wrong signal, a, a reboot of the machine won't do it. You've got to power them off, got to clear that out, power everything back on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so these are basically the same thing. Uh, and so, yeah, basically they started to get an inkling of what was causing it, uh, and then eventually they managed to sort it out. Uh, but basically, they found that if a specific uh, bit, so if, you know, at offset like 47F in a packet, if the value happened to be 32 or 33, which is uh, the ASCII for the digits 2 or 3, uh, the NIC will just die and stop receiving packets. It'll like lose sync entirely. Huh. Huh. And I. Uh, Oh, I was just going to say. And, and it I, could only be revived by a full power cycle. I've always had tremendous luck with Intel server NICs. Yep. Uh, well, you know, th that basically that's offset. That's like a byte, like 1140 something or something. So a good chunk of your packets are not even going to be that long to possibly trigger this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only one specific chip, not all Intel NICs. Uh, However, to complicate things, if at that specific offset the value was 34 yeah. or the ASCII for the digit 4, then that NIC would be inoculated and that NIC would no longer crash if it received a 32 or a 33. Right? 
Mm-hmm. So in their attempts to test it, sometimes uh, this four would come up and make the Nick not do that anymore. <laughs> and the only way to make it do it again was to power cycle again. <laughs> and basically, it turns out that in their VoIP packets, the SIP protocol has some text, and it sometimes this one particular thing would line up there, and it would always have a value of like 10, 20, 30, or 40, which would cause that one that two, three, or four to be in that specific place. These guys are scratching their heads going, what? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they had all kinds of fun trying to sort it out. Right. Uh, and after a great deal of testing to reproduce the problem, uh, because the NIC would get inoculated, it, wouldn't, it would stop failing. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, I thought we had this figured out, but now we're sending the packet and it's not dying. But, <laughs> so they had to be careful not to send a four because it would make the twos not kill the packet anymore. <laughs> Uh, so yes, the story they have posted there is really quite uh, interesting and engaging. Yeah. Just walking got, through all the steps that they, they went some, through. Uh, yeah, they got they got some. It's a great post with uh, yes. with the good and the bad uh, packets in there, and they're just screenshots of their Wireshark capture, and uh, I'm loving yeah. this. and going through. And uh, they also have uh, packet captures, and uh, they recommend the tool TCP Replay. Oh, uh, yeah, which I've basically heard of that. allows you to take a packet capture from TCP dump or Wireshark Mm -hmm. and send those packets out again. Uh, And so basically you can TCP replay this against uh, your Intel next and see if it crashes them or use it to inoculate them. Well, and uh, so are they going to have to do like a... They talked to Intel and Intel sent them uh, some information on how to like patch the EEPROM or... Well, that's what I was going to ask. So is Intel going to patch this? Uh, okay. yeah, and I think depending on uh, your situation, you can uh, request Intel will send you a new chip to put into the NIC. Oh wow! Or whatever, or uh, because you know if it's a server NIC, then you know it's covered a little more. You know if you yeah. paid one hundred and fifty dollars or more for your NIC, you want it to work. Yeah. Um. Uh. But the details are a little still unclear. But uh, the information is in the post, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. I have an Intel NIC that sometimes will just die unexpectedly. And I kind of wonder if it's related. Now, have you had to power off to fix it? You think? You well, remember? I've done a reboot, but because of the specific Core 2 Duos, they, they kind of do a power cycle when they reboot anyway. Oh, so you don't know, because they could be so resetting the sure. PCI cards. Yes. Yeah. 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 If you have, some other words do that. So yeah, like some of them actually um, do a full cycle on the anything. That's, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I noticed, like, when I had that same chip in my desktop, on the same motherboard, when I turn it on, it would, like, spin up for a second, then stop completely, and then start again. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. But, yeah, it was the onboard network card on this one specific motherboard, and two of the five different machines sometimes would have this problem. And come to think of it, one of them was the one that ran an asterisk server. <laughs> Yeah. But it's happened to one of the other ones, too. Uh, but they're both under heavy MySQL load where they might have ASCII numbers going through a lot, right? Where it might trigger that. You just, you never, you never even think of something like that. I mean, yeah. you know, like, you would never... The fact that they managed to find this is truly amazing. Yes. And, and that they were able to recover from their little, uh, uh, you know, snafu where it was got a little bit of a twist in the, in the test. Yes, or where they could end up <clears throat> inoculating it. And <laughs> that's just the weirdest part. But it, it appears to have something to do with the, uh, these Intel NICs have support for BMC, uh, or baseboard management, mm-hmm. uh, basically where the NIC can have two different Macs and one of them lets you access the, uh, a remote management system for the computer. And there's something about turning that on or off or you know, magic packets or something. And it was... But uh, they verified that the problem, at first they, they figured the problem might have been just like with the driver or with the operating system. That's what I would think, yeah. Uh, but they managed to reproduce it under like four different operating systems, including Solaris, FreeBSD, Linux, and Windows. <laughs> Let's and then they managed to even make it happen while the machine uh, was at the bad boot media state. So basically, with no, no disk in the machine, <laughs> it's trying, it failed the boot, and then they managed to do it. So. That, it's that, happening like at the yeah. Ethernet level. It's that's about like, that's about as much of a slam dunk as you can get there. It's it's a layer two bug. It's yeah. it's not even up in like the TCP stack. It's it's down at you know the Ethernet packet causes the uh, 
the machine to fail. Or uh, the now, to fail. Of course. See, this is the kind of thing now folks aren't watching live. See, if you're watching live, you can just in the chat room say, Alan, can I have a link to that story? Although you shouldn't, but you could. And Alan will give you a link to that story. But if you wanted to watch after the fact, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. And uh, so you'll see TechSnap96 posted there, and you can click on that. And when you go there, it will have all the links we talked to. So here, if you're watching the video version, is TechSnap95. And if you scroll down below the download links, there's all the show notes that Alan puts together. And uh, there's uh, lots of information and links you can read on your own. Any other thoughts on that one, Alan? Uh, nope. Well, folks, while you're over the Jupiter Broadcasting site, hit the affiliate links at the bottom of our website to help support the network and the show. We have links down there for Amazon and Netflix and ThinkGeek. And you know what? This would be a good time to mention our book pick, because if you buy this, we'll have this linked in the show notes, and uh, it'll be an affiliate link. And it's called Homeland. It's from Cory Doctorow, and it is a follow-up to, I would say, his very successful book called Little Brother, which, Alan, yes. I know you've read. Yes. I own it in hardcover. And it's like... You know, if if you follow this show and you're you know you look at technology and the trends and privacy, these books are for you. And Cory Doctorow is, you know, a great writer. I've read his free yes, stories. and he was. Well, uh, that's the other thing is that all his books are written under a Creative Commons license, so you can actually read them for free on his website. Yeah, I like to buy it because it's you know he's charging yes. eleven bucks and he gets a little yeah. money and you know we get a little money. And he's also good to ensure that there's usually an audiobook version of it as well. Here's the tease. After a few years, a few years later, California's economy collapses. This is this follows. This picks up after Little Brother, but uh, Marcus Pass lands him in a job web, as a webmaster for a crusading politician who promises to reform. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a great book, and uh, it's it's yes, it, it touches on a lot of digital privacy things. It, yeah, it's getting great reviews too. Uh, well, from all yeah, the it's because Corey's actually kind of like an open source advocate. He worked for the uh, EFF and. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he knows the he stuff. He knows what this stuff is. Yeah. And he knows uh, what it can do. Yeah. And so, like, in the first book, you know, m- modeling your Xbox and creating this, like, Tor-based private network for the uh, dissidents to talk to each other or, like, having a, a GPG key signing party. I don't think I've ever heard that mentioned in a novel before. <laughs> I know. And there's a lot of geeky things in there that, that yeah. us, uh, us geeks can appreciate. So go check it out, you guys. Yes. If you'd like to grab that, it's Homeland from Cory Doctorow. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And if you grab that, it supports the TechSnap program and Cory. That's pretty cool. Yep. All right, Alan. With all the news done, that means it's time for the TechSnap feedback. sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or heck, even starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Jude, are you ready for the first email this week? Yep. All right, it comes from Dr. Kraz. He says, hey, Alan and Chris. It's Dr. Kraz again, and I have a follow-up to my question from a few weeks ago regarding ultimate servers. I have another question or two. So to recap, I'm setting up an old computer as a media storage server for my home. It will have 8 gigabytes of RAM and an Intel Core 2 Duo 3 gigahertz processor. You had suggested FreeNAS as I had stated wanting to sync my teeth into BSD. I hadn't mentioned the hard drives that were going to be going in it because I didn't know at the time. Uh, so some of the things you'd like to this machine to be able to do. Stream media to my Android slash Roku devices. He wants to use sick beard slash couch potato to grab TV shows and auto download torrents as I provide. I'm not worried about using it as a desktop machine, but I'm not sure how stripped down FreeBSD is versus free NAS. Again, I love the show. I think the service you guys provide to the tech community is awesome. It's nice to know that I can get one podcast and get some really great and important tech news and advice. Keep up the great work, Dr. Kraz. So this is interesting. I don't know if I would yes. recommend free NAS for those particular functions. Yeah, um... They have these plug-in jails, yeah. uh, but I don't know if anyone's created like a plug-in for Sickbeard and so on. You know, uh, so and I, I don't I, know if Sickbeard is in the port street even. I, 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 so that's like, where I, I started. I is, but... It's kind of hit and miss. Like, there are forum threads where they'll give you step-by-step tutorials to getting both Couch Potato and Sickbeard working on free NAS uh, through the plug-in system. But it just, it's, it's not that awesome. It's not that great. Right. And the problem was, it, I went through it, and then I determined it was literally faster for me to spin up an Ubuntu VM and app get installed them in Ubuntu than it was to get them working on FreeNAS. Right. Uh, and, you know, if you actually want to learn FreeBSD, then you could just install FreeBSD and then add all that stuff on top after. Yeah. And you'll be less restricted because you won't necessarily have to work in a jail and so on. But uh, both, uh, for uh, folks out there, both Couch Potato, I, I, I did an in-depth look on Sickbeard. Um, and, right, uh, I remember that. The, 
those are some really powerful tools, but uh, you got to, you know, yeah, that can be a little tricky to set up on, on free now. But yeah, like, uh, I don't know how the Roku works for streaming. Oh, yeah, the streaming like, point. Like, can, it, can it just stream off a Samba share, or does it need, like, DLNA, or... Yeah, I'm not so sure about the Roku. Uh, I know I, I know one thing that's pretty popular in the Jupiter Broadcasting audience is Plex. There's a Plex app for Roku, and then you run the Plex server, and the Plex server runs on... I know it runs on Linux. I'm pretty sure it runs on BSDs, too. Right. And then it'll do transcoding and things like that for the Roku. And I, I think that's support. DLNA, and it, like, that yeah, works I think even it like uses a PlayStation DLNA to, or yep. a bunch of things like that. Yep. Uh, that's actually using QPNP. Yeah. Discuss that. That's yeah. Fun. Uh, mm. I've also used, uh, with some success, PS3 Media Server. That requires Java. Yep. Uh, that yep. works pretty well. And uh, uh, MediaTomb is another one that I have used. So, yeah, there's a lot of different options as far yeah. as the streaming goes. To the Android devices, um, <clears throat> Plex, again, is probably going to be uh, uh, another option. It depends on which device. So that's kind of the right. thing to answer. Uh, my solution at home is properly tuned Samba, and then my Media Center is also... a FreeBSD machine with KDE, uh, but I imagine Android over your Wi-Fi could access the Samba share oh, and play an MP4 oh, yeah, file. Yeah, like natively. with Astro, there's a there's file managers called like Astro that'll do Samba browsing. You know, and I've actually found Samba is just the most straightforward. If you have it, like I, that's what one of the things I love about my Boxy boxes, and I'm I'm kind of sad that I think I have to get rid of them after time because they just connect to Samba shares and they don't care what the file format is. The bo the Boxy box has the codec. So that's the, oh, that's the other thing about browsing Samba shares, right? Is then it's up to the operating system, the the, the playback application device, yeah, to have the codecs. Whereas if you use something right. like Plex or PS3 Media Server, it will do the transcoding to whatever codec the device right. supports. Now. Yes. Currently, almost everything's H.264, so yeah, we, yeah. you know, uh, like my parents' smart TV, I can just plug a USB stick in or browse the Samba share and hit an MKV or an AVI, and it just plays it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that makes me happy. I think the Roku has pretty broad codec support, but you know, what's so. sad is I have a Roku sitting right there that's not hooked up. Would be, I should get that hooked up? Uh, Check out. I just got one as well. It hasn't been delivered yet, but. Uh, because we've been uh, playing with uh, creating Roku channels. Well, you remember we have a Jupiter Scare Broadcasting tra channel on there that has the live right. stream. So that's that's one reason I've been wanting yes. to check well, out. Uh, the ones we're building are fake live streams. It's basically a playlist of VOD yeah, yeah. running on our server. Yeah, which is kind of what I do here during the yep. on there. All right, well, great question, Dr. Kras. Except Good for luck. it's server-side. Yeah. This is a new, it's a new feature. We just. I know. Just I it. want that, Alan. I want that. I tell you. Well, one of these days, if nothing else, it'd be nice for like a weekend if I shut down to do some... Yep. Some work or something. Uh, all right. Next email comes in from Nick, and he says, Hi, Chris and Alan. I'm a fairly new listener, but I've been finding it harder and harder to wait for each new episode of the Linux Action Show and TechSnap. And I'm, and my, and my as always, my curiosity is getting the best of me. Well, then you should be listening to Coda Radio and Unfilter and Sidebite and Fosho in between. But definitely go check out Coda Radio. Yep. He says, uh, You've mentioned VMs in several shows recently and how advantageous they are. I've played with them a bit, but for plain purposes only and after looking on the internet and still not finding any sound reasoning to give me a peace of mind well, I wonder why would one want multiple VMs that are sluggish and slow compared to physical machines on your network what am I missing please set a novice's mind at ease thanks and keep up the great work love the content so this is an this interesting is question, kind right? of the scale engine philosophy of why all of our servers are hardware based but um, there are a number of reasons uh, if you say need uh, first of all, you can isolate things, so you can have your web server in one VM and your mail server in another VM, and if something happens to one, it doesn't affect the other. That's a very nice. Um, if you have multiple uh, VM hosts, then you can do live migration. So like we talked about the other week, you could move a VM from one machine to another machine mm -hmm. uh, without restarting it. So think about like if you're having a hardware failure or something like right. that. That's very nice. Yes, if you abstract, then yeah, you can also have... So yeah, if one of the physical machines dies, the VM just moves to a different physical machine yep. and keeps running. Um, but yeah, like if you're a big company and you end up needing 100 servers, rather than buying 100 servers, if you can buy 20 big servers and then run 5 or 10 virtual machines on each one, 
it saves you a lot of money. Yeah, and I think that maybe is a piece that Nick is missing is a lot of times it's done on much larger iron. So these yeah. systems, you know, they have tons of memory and tons of processor, and the processors have extensions that make them faster at handling virtualization. They're yeah, using like, a different type of virtualization that's closer to the metal, so you're getting more performance on the virtual right, machines. Right, like hardware virtualization with like VTX and extended page tables yep, yep. means you're getting very close to native performance. Mm-hmm. And and of course, there's also just the whole peace of mind. You know, if I'm going to do 50 operating system updates on a CentOS box, I snapshot that sucker first. And then if a, if an update breaks something, I just roll the snapshot back, and I'm right where I was before I screwed up the system, and I don't have hours and hours and hours of fixing a production box or a test Luckily, box. Luckily, if if your file if your operating system is installed on top of ZFS, then you can do that without a VM. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. It's not even a default thing yet. Like you know, you you have to use the PCBSD installer in order to do it without having to do it manually. The other uh, thing I would mention too is he mentioned the performance element, and all things being equal, the physical machine, you know, with raw hardware is going to be faster. But something yes. you have to consider is you don't always need incredible performance for server-side operations like a DNS server or exactly. an LDAP server. They don't have to be super, super fast. So you can spin up a small VM with maybe 2 gigs of RAM and maybe a 20 gigabyte drive allocated to it. Yep. And you can sort of divvy things up because they don't have to be very fast. So you can sort of allocate more resources to more things that way. And if yep. they're a little and slower, no big deal. Some of your virtual machine managers will even let you over-allocate RAM. Mm -hmm. You know, give each virtual, run 10 virtual machines, each with 4 gigs of RAM, even though you only have 32 gigs of RAM. And then it just moves it around. Or you can do resource limitations. So you can say, I have to process this directory of 1,000 images and resize them all. I could, you know, if you run that on a, on a bare metal server, it'll just max out the machine and peg it out. Well, that's good. But if you have other production things going on in the network, maybe you want to limit the amount of resources that machine. Yep. So we have, for example, I, I, I have Linux boxes that say they cannot use more than 50% of the host uh, memory or, or processor. So that way I always know, regardless of how hard the users hammer that box, I always have overhead for all the other systems that have to continue to run for other production right. purposes. Although you can run processes on specific CPUs. I know in Windows and FreeBSD, I'm sure you can do it on Linux as well. Yeah, I, I like having... And so on. But I yeah. like just... Because in the case that I'm talking about, I'm using ESX, and I like just saying... Because yeah. the other thing that's nice in ESX and other virtualization platforms too is I can put things in groups and I can say everything yep. in this group has this set of resource limitations applied to it. And yep. I just move a server in and, and out of that group. And some of them also can do... Burstable, so yeah. you can have lots of CPU for five minutes, but if you keep using it for a solid five minutes, then it throttles you back. Mm-hmm. So if you just need that little burst of speed, you can have it, but you can't hog it all all the time. I also the other thing that's nice about VMs you touched on this when you started talking about it, is you can move them around machines. They're inherently portable. So I also will sometimes build a server at my house using VMware Workstation get everything set up, bill for that time, and then drive down to the clients, copy it onto their network server, and fire it up on their server, and it's ready yep. to go. And so that's really nice, too. So there's a certain or, amount you know, of portability with things there. like snapshots and clones, you could have a server that's working and then say, oh, I want five of those now. Yeah. Or, hey, I want to try updating the new CS- CMS application. I'm going to yep. take a snapshot. I have a clone of this machine now. It's exactly identical to the production. Let's apply this new program and see what breaks or see what works. And then you could always put that one back. In fact, you know, I start, I've been playing with virtualiz- virtualization for so long. That's how I actually did my first NT4 to Active Directory migration. This mm. is way back in the day. Is I brought our entire NT4 domain and all of its, you know, like a, like versions of all of the servers that we had, all the all the backup domain controllers and primary domain yeah. controllers, and I. Upgraded all of those to Windows 2000 in VM, brought them all up to Active Directory, had workstations in that domain, had them logging in, and we recreated our network, our Microsoft Directory network, inside this virtual network on a dedicated switch and tested everything before we did the actual deployment the next weekend. So there's tons of reason to use virtualization. And yeah. and sometimes, you know, like Alan said, sometimes performance you take a little bit of a hit, but depending on the workload. You know, if your application can cache a lot in RAM, uh, then a lot of times the, the performance hit to uh, to uh, VM is not that substantial if you're using RAM, but yeah. Yeah, but a lot of times the biggest hit in a VM is the I/O. Uh, but if you can, you know, do iSCSI or something and have better I/O, then it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's just uh, a lot of virtual machines are basically you're talking is a special virtual machine file format that tries to save space on top of the file system of the host, which is then going to the 
controller in the disk. So you basically you're simul- you have the file system in the VM talking to the virtual disk controller, which is talking to the virtual disk, which is actually a file uh, with a sitting special on a formatting, file system. which is then sitting on another file system, which is to, on another controller on a real disk eventually. With another kernel in the mix. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, some, uh, like I've done ones where I've, you know, allocated a partition to a virtual machine to yeah. cut a bunch of that out, and that does help. Uh, but yeah, if you can do iSCSI to just, mm-hmm. you know, say remote block device, use that. Right. Uh, you can, sometimes that'll give you a, a good performance boost. Next email? If your network is fast enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, you generally want to have, if you're doing VM and iSCSI, you generally want to have a dedicated switch and network for the iSCSI traffic. Yeah. And, and, and well, yeah. you know, there's some latency there too. It's like, mm-hmm. you're, yeah. you're not going to get less than, uh, you know, uh, the speed of the packets. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's got to go through switches and stuff, and there's yeah. some delay there. Uh, all right, so the next email comes from Dashar. He says, hi, guys. First off, congratulations, Alan, on the new house, which, by the way, for you audio listeners, Alan now has a world map behind him. It's very fancy. The chat room was very impressed with your world that, map. <laughs> that, was, that was behind me at the old house, yeah, but I know. <laughs> then the screen went up and yeah, you couldn't see it, it as yeah. much. He says, uh, so looking, looking at the rootkits and fake SSH demons that affect Linux now, how can you protect yourself on shared hosting accounts? I mean, is there a way to encrypt data on a shared account that even the root user can't access? Or is there a way, at least, to detect such activity? I've been using shared hosting for websites that I make manage for my clients, and depending on their budget, I use different hosting providers. And I'm a little suspicious about one of them that might be compromised. How can I check out or protect my data as a normal user? And uh, he also, he asked about international shipping for the episode 100 t-shirts, which we will talk about in just a little bit. So what do you think, Alan? Protecting yourself on a shared host. What do you, any ideas? Uh, well, if you want the web server to be able to read the content, it has to be decrypted. Uh, so, you know, you have to trust root. Uh, yeah, if you, want, if you want any daemon on that shared host to be able to read the data. Yeah. And and if you're just using it to store data that you may be then, retrieving yeah, you over can, FTP... Then yeah, you can encrypt it or whatever, but yeah. you can't encrypt the files if you want people to be able to access them over the website. Can you think of a way that you could audit a shared host to make sure it's conforming or uh... not? If you don't have root on it, and if yeah. you know if you're root, then you have less of an issue. Um, yeah, it's kind of the thing with shared hosting is you have to trust the hosting company. Yeah, I mean that's the benefit and the downside. The be- yep. if they're a good company, then you trust that they're going to keep things patched and updated. Yep. So you don't you, you're in theory not supposed to have to worry about it. Yeah, uh, you know, you're using shared hosting because you don't want to have to manage the server. So I, you're I, trusting you know, them to manage the server for you. I, I would say one thing you could do is like a lot of them offer logs so you can see when lo- you know through the admin C panel or whatever, they'll tell you when somebody logged in. You know, yep. you can look at your data transfer rates and see if they exceed what you suspect. That sometimes actually, that, that you know what, that's sometimes how I have determined it in the past, is I've looked at my data charts and I've been like, whoa, that chart's way up. They're, and I haven't been using it like that. And then, oh, my FTP server's been compromised. <laughs> they got it. And you know what it usually is on a shared host, so they just figured out the login. Yep. Um, and so just, forcing. Yeah. Check logs, check logins. Um, I don't know outside of that, really. Maybe some other warning signs. But uh, all right. Next email comes from... Joel, and he just wants to say, hey, guys. Oh, I should have actually done this before the show. Uh, hey, guys, I've, I've seen an issue with the current W3 Total Cache update killing websites going around. So I guess there's an update that's been killing websites. Uh, I know you use it on your uh-huh. sites and thought you might like to know. Also, I'd really appreciate it if you did a show on WordPress, how you guys use it and how you make it secure. Thanks for the show, Joel. You know, that might actually be interesting because I've been using WordPress for years now. And yeah. you've got uh, tons of experience with it. Yeah, I, I wrote a, a talk about it once, too, because... Uh, that came up at uh, a hackathon I was at, or you know, not a hackathon. It was a, a maybe we should put that in our uh, in our back pocket for like if yeah. we need to pre if we need to tape ahead an episode or something like that. And yeah, because we're gonna have to probably for one hundred one because I'll right. be in Asia. Tokyo, Tokyo. So maybe um, maybe that yeah. might be a topic for one hundred one because we got Good a ton one, of yes. stuff for that. Uh, cause that's interesting because I had a client who updated his plugins and it killed his website. And I told him you know disable each one. Disable all of them and enable them one at a time until you find out which one's breaking it. And it might have been W3 Total Cat. Mm, well, I, yeah, well, I've been meaning to update it, but I'm glad. I, I mean, I want to yeah. on one hand, but I don't want to on the other. Yeah. Uh, I'm in Tokyo. I leave on the 14th and get back on the 20th for Asia BSD Con. That's pretty cool. Which I hope to be live streaming from there. Oh, my gosh, Alan. That'd be so cool. We, you know, if you do that, you got to let me know. We'll rebroadcast it here on the, on the JB Live stream, sure. too. 
Uh, all right. Well, now uh, we well, had yeah, because it probably wouldn't be while you're doing anything because they're twelve hours yeah, off. Yeah. So it'll be like the middle of the night or something. Do we preempt it? We would go live to Alan on location if it was during the show. <laughs> oh, right. That's gonna be better than anything we got going, anyways. <laughs> well, it'd be Saturday and Sunday, and there's nothing on Saturday. <clears throat> no. And then it wouldn't hit last, I'm sure, because of the time zone. So that would actually be pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, if everything works out, when I go to Linux Fest at the end of April, I want to stream all day Saturday, and we want to have a booth, and we basically, they want to set us up in the path, so as people, you know, are doing the booth stuff, people that we want to have just sit down and chat with us, we'd be just streaming that all day Saturday, so it'd be fun to have stuff on there from time to time. Now, in the feedback section, we have a great blog post from Stack Exchange, and why we still believe in working remotely. Yes, uh... So they talk about some of the pros and cons of working remotely and so on, and it's uh, pretty interesting. Let's you hire uh, good people who can't move. Boy, isn't that true? Yes. Uh, you know, as someone who's worked remotely for the last couple of years, you know, it can be hard at times, but it's also very useful. I think I found one of the hardest things about working at home is realizing when I need to actually get out of the house and take a mental yep. break because sometimes you and just, just feel... separating. Being work at home and, and yeah. being at work. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, as part of having this new house, I'm setting up a separate desk in a separate space in the house. So I'm, I go to work, work there, and then I come home and I'm sitting at a different computer and in yeah. a different room See. and it's a different mindset. And I have heard from a lot desk. of people who have successful home businesses that that's how they've done it. And I hope to eventually one day, I want to move the studio out of my house. So that way, because right now they're just so blended together. I can't go in yeah. my office without seeing Jupiter Broadcasting work. And vice versa. Right. Well, if you kept it all in the garage, it'd be okay, I guess. But. Yeah, if I edit it out here. But it's so cold. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it, also just getting up out of the house helps me come that, up, that's come up with solutions. That's my concern with uh, having everything in my basement is that mm -hmm. it's, like, it's going to be cold. <laughs> uh, you know, there's also, you know, there's a couple other points that they make. You don't lose people to silly things like their significant other being uh, going to medical school. Because yes. uh, you know, they don't yeah. have to move away. Uh, yeah. If you hire someone great and then all of a sudden they have to move. If you can keep them on, then that's I great. like this as a perspective from a manager. It makes you focus on more than butts and chairs. You know, yeah. it's easily, and, and I think managers fall into this. They see how many hours somebody's ass is in that chair, and they equate that to their value to the company yep. instead of focusing more on the end results. Exactly. Yeah. Great post. And they also have... Yeah. Uh, I wanted to cover it a little more in depth, but I didn't get time for it. They also have a section of what they've learned. And so if you're a remote worker, you're struggling with that, go look at this link. Stock yes. exchange is great. So you know yes, it's going to be yeah. a good post. Uh, and they're also, I read somewhere that some of the people from there are working on a, a new type of forum that looks very interesting. Ooh. They would be, they would be the ones to do it. Yes, because, uh, you know, stack exchanges, things like, uh, well, it's the one called uh, there's a, there's Stack a, Overflow. Yeah, and, Stack Overflow. Uh, and there's, and the there's a whole... Is, uh, server Fault is the one for sysadmins. Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that are based off of it, too. There's yeah, there's food one ones. for startups, and yeah. there's everything. And uh, they've done a good job with it. Now, I didn't know you to be a Tumblr troller, but the I next... wasn't. I found this on Twitter and got directed to it. Oh, okay. All right. So this is great. It's called DevOps Reactions, and it's a Tumblr feed that is... this For you audio listeners, you got to go look at this link. Uh, this is from, uh, what's that uh, show called? The, uh, the IT crowd, right? The yep. IT crowd? Yeah, Shot yeah. from the IT crowd. It says, how a sysadmin looks when there's an emergency and he's dealing it without panicking. And it's a shot of, of the guy from the IT crowd. Awesome. There's a fire on his desk. And he looks up at it, acknowledges the fire's there, and goes right back to work. <laughs> Love it, because yeah. it's so true. It, you know, it is so, people know, sometimes you just get in the most stressful. It does feel like things are on fire around you. And yet after a while, at a certain point in your career, you either just learn to be like, okay, well, it's another emergency and I'll handle it. Or you just, you know, you eat a hole in your stomach. I don't know <laughs> what the other alternative yep. is. But there's some great ones on the stomach. There's one on the front page about debugging recursive code is an awesome animation. Yes, yes. Just over and over again, over and over again. Yeah, there's some really funny animated GIFs on this one. I think one of my favorites, though, is... When AWS, when an AWS region goes down and you're not using AWS, and it's just a GIF of Michael Jackson sitting there eating popcorn and enjoying the movie, <laughs> just like more. Yeah. So those are great. Developer reactions, or I'm sorry, DevOps reactions. Tumblr. Com. If you guys yeah. want to go check that out after the show, it's like there's one that's asking the security team for a firewall exception. It's just a guy kind of slowly shaking his head no. <laughs> adding uh, uh, adding uh, new firewall rules is Gandalf. You shall not pass. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Good find, Alan. Or they found this uh, 
4chan animation for this one. And it's like, uh, database backup has been failing for the last week. And the guy is just pressing the unsee button as fast as he can. Oh. So uh, there you go. All right. Well, uh, so folks, if you want to uh, contact the show, email us techsnap at Jupiter Broadcasting. Now, before we get out of the feedback, I want to mention we have our TechSnap 100 shirt. Yes. Uh, and we're working on this. This will be a limited time offer. The run will be o- over by the time TechSnap 100 is on the air. We're going to launch it on Tuesday. And it is a Teespring campaign. We'll have to have 100 people pre-order the shirt before it'll even open up. And then, we, of course, we can take any more pre-orders beyond 100. But if we get 100 people yeah. to order the shirt, which is a lot, we have never sold that many shirts. Because, honestly, we have found that when you offer a shirt, people will buy it sort of onesie twosies. So we're trying a limited time uh, run for only episode 100. Uh, we might down the road do a polo shirt, do something that doesn't something have a swear like word on it, something like that. But on Tuesday of next week, February 12th, we will launch the TechSnap 100 shirt campaign, and then we'll tell you about it in the next episode. So it'll be just yeah, for a so limited it's, shirt. It's basically like a Kickstarter for T-shirts. It is exactly uh, that, yeah. Basically, T-shirts are expensive to order in small quantities, but if we can sell 100 or more of them, then they become a price that's reasonable for everybody. So we need everybody to go and order their T-shirts. Next yep. week, we'll give you the URL. Yep, we'll tweet it out and put it on Google+, and all of that kind of stuff. And it'll and we'll be in the show notes next week, yep. and we will... Remind and, you repeatedly. And, and longtime fans, it's got, it's got stuff on there that longtime fans will like. And we've picked a high-quality fabric, and it's, it's going to have a nice light blue color to it that Alan and I uh, think looks pretty good. So uh, that'll be really, really exciting. It's the only first time we've ever done anything like this. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can celebrate your 100th episode. But honestly, our, our way to celebrate is just to keep doing what we do every single week because this is what we enjoy doing, and this is, this is our format. But we thought it'd be a, it'd be a lot of fun. For a limited time thing. Yes. Just to see and how And unlike other podcasts, when we say every single week, we mean every single week. That's right. Yeah, that's for, that's for sure. So, uh, of course, you'll hear more about it next week. But if you want to be one of the first people to put your pre-order in, uh, check uh, like uh, my Twitter feed on Tuesday or my Google Plus page or something. Or tune in next week and you'll yes. see it. All uh, right, Alan. Uh, Flammy from the chat room points out that uh, the caption uh, from uh, like the what actually happens on that episode of the IT crowd where that fire starts. Yeah, it's Moss looks up and then writes an email saying to whom it may concern. There's a fire. Fire. Hope you <laughs> hope to be hearing from you soon. Uh, you know the chat room brings up a, a great question. I've already seen this question come up about uh, what the shipping's going to be for the shirts. We uh, I actually think these rates are really great. So domestic U.S. shipping will be four dollars uh, plus uh, twenty five dollars for each additional shirt. International shipping is seven dollars plus a dollar for each. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say $25? I meant 25 cents. Yes. Uh, it's 25 cents for each additional shirt domestically. To ship internationally, it'll be $7 which, oh, and an additional dollar for each shirt. So either way, international or domestic, it's going to be less than 7 bucks for shipping. Yes, which is... Uh, That's quite, a great deal. Yep. Yeah. So uh, hopefully hopefully everybody out there wants one of these because I, I am really excited about doing it. I think it's a really fun thing to do for episode 100. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning into this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. 